Hi, I thought we'd take a look at the first returned EEV blog BM235 multimeter. Um, Frank actually bought one of these. He's in uh, Jacksonville in Florida, and unfortunately, he got it and it didn't work. And he's, um, you know, he described all sorts of things in that um, it would, you know, measure in say a 1.5 volt battery, and it'd measure 0.6 volts, and then it'd drift down to zero and and all sorts of stuff, weird things didn't work at all. And um, I've sold, I think, uh, over a thousand of these meters so far, and this is the first one that's reported any issues like this at all. So, you know, you expect this sort of thing to happen, even though each meter is individually uh, tested at the factory, it has to be because it has to be calibrated at the factory. So each one would have been tested, but you expect some sort of infant mortality rate on virtually any uh, product out there. It's not just uh, this meter, but any electronic uh, product, there is going to be some percentage of failure rate um, after they're tested and they hit the field. It's just, you know, the way it is for whatever reason. Um, and that's no reflection on the quality of the thing or well, it could be, okay, but uh, in this case, sold over a thousand, no problems, and this is the only one. So, you know, who knows, Murphy's Law, uh, we've, we've got one, we got one, and sorry, my voice is still terrible, um, I haven't made any videos this week, because, um, yeah, I just, uh, yeah, you don't, probably don't want to see me on camera either, so uh, I look and feel pretty terrible at the moment. And uh, if you haven't been following me on Twitter, I'm breaking in all sorts of ways. I've busted my um, ACL joint in my knee is completely busted. Anyway, um, there's the probes. So yeah, I might have to get surgery on that. So yeah, I'm doing wonderful at the moment. Let's unwrap this puppy and have a look. And see if A, it's repeatable. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty sure, you know, from the stuff he was uh, saying, it was pretty obvious that this thing was dead. So let's turn it on and uh, see what we've got here. Switch on. He said it worked on AC, curiously. Now that, you know, function-wise, it's, it's displaying the right stuff. Okay, so there we go. Okay, no drama at all. I've got a... Um, I've got my voltage uh, reference here. I've got it set to a volt. This is my lab reference, one of my lab reference standards. So let's plug it in and um, see if we get a volt. Wah, 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 wah. He's right. Look, it's going down and down. It's not like it's on AC mode. It's on DC mode. And sure enough, I mean, if I bring in a good one over here, and of course it will uh, measure... A volt, no worries whatsoever. So, um, yeah, that is one sick puppy. What is wrong with it? Wow. Let's maybe whack it on ohms here and uh, disconnect that. And okay, ohms works. Oh no, that was continuity. That was con. Oh, continuity mode. Look. <laughs> nope. Okay. Ohms is just showing direct short. That's interesting. That's interesting. I well, I was gonna maybe there's some sort of um, solder short on the board or something that's causing that. I mean, obviously our chipset's working fine, um, and there's not much in this apart from a uh, the multimeter chipset. That's pretty much the only active circuitry and the LCD driver chip. Um, the capacitance. Oh, that seems a bit high. 13 nanofarads, I'm not... Hang on, I've got a reference cap here. Here we go, let's check it out. I've got myself a... Um, these are very nice, if you can pick them up on eBay cheap. They're old, but uh, these Arco standard capacitors, they're very, very nice. And um, you can often get them quite cheap. Ah, uh, that's low. That's low. Put it over here. But at least it's functional. There we go. No dramas whatsoever. That's well within spec. Um, so, yeah, this one is a bit... And I've checked other meters. I think that is, yeah. So this one's a bit low on cap. Let's measure some current, shall we? Here we go. I'm feeding in one milliamp. Current range works. Current range works. 10 milliamps, 100 milliamps. 
Hey, okay. That's interesting. That shows that, well, because the, um, the current uses a different input arrangement. So, yeah, there's something with that main common terminal, which, you know, is like, so it's not the chipset. It's not like, I don't know, ESD or something else has gone wrong with the chipset and it's damaged because the current just works fine. Let's try the microamp uh, range, 100 microamps. There you go. Yep. It works just fine and dandies. And hold on to your hats. The uh, millivolt range works fine and dandy as well. So, um, yeah, that's interesting. So millivolt range works. Current ranges work. Uh, so chipset is just fine. But all the other functionality, like if we go back here to uh, volts, you know, like that is, that is dead. And it's just jiggle the range switch around here jiggle is a technical term and um it's not that so looks like something on the front end of this thing is gone on particular ranges the millivolt range is basically straight in it doesn't go through the input divider or anything else um unfortunately i do not have the schematic for this um brian will not uh release it uh, to me they say it's proprietary blah 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 yeah okay fair enough um so we don't have that but hey, we can at least have a look around. Let's go. The serial number for those playing along at home. And we're in like Flynn. Um, unfortunately, we're gonna to have to take this uh, top board out here. That's uh, one of the downsides of uh, having the Cat 4 rating in such a small meter. It's the only way they can physically uh, do it. And that's where uh, a bit of the input uh, circuitry is around there. But we can see other stuff on here. And uh, I might actually, uh, get out the uh, Tagano microscope, just get the two side by side and see what we can see. Oh, and the other annoying thing about having the secondary board here is because I do have to actually desolder this and unplug, um, essentially unplug the uh, jacks and everything else to get in there. We can't sort of like feed in stuff and then measure it on the main board underneath at the same time. So that's, well, you can if you go to a lot of trouble to wire it back in and stuff, but yeah, it just makes it a bit tricky to troubleshoot. But the first uh, thing you do with troubleshooting something like this is visual, especially if you've got a unit co to compare it against. All right, let's check this out. We've got our unhappy camper on the left here and our happy camper on the right. And uh, I probably just... Uh, just because you can do a quick uh, visual inspection to see if there's any missing parts. Now, this, you know, shouldn't be the case because, as I said, it would have passed factory test, factory calibration, everything else. To do that, it would have had to have everything um, in place. But I don't know, something might have made the poor contact and then in shipping it might have vanished or something like that. But um, I obviously can't see under the uh, uh, input board yet, but... There doesn't look to be any issue here at all. I wouldn't expect that, but uh, see the nice little uh, star grounding point there. Very nice, just going off. Someone knew what they were doing in terms of uh, PCB layout, but uh, yeah, there's nothing obvious going on there at all. As I said, um, the main chipset down here, which is um, uh, BTC, which is Bryman Technology Corp, uh, branded. I don't know exactly what one it is. They won't tell me. Um, but uh, that is obviously not failed because half the functions work and the other half don't. So there's got to be something screwy with some with something to do with the input. So that all looks hunky-dory. The other thing, next thing I would look for is uh, any um, shorts, like uh, little solder balls or anything like that um, as part of the production process, which could have uh, got in there and they may not have been an issue during the uh, during the process. I love my Tagano microscope here. It's beautiful, isn't it? Um, I can go all the way in and go all the way with LBJ. Look at that. You can see the uh, silk screen's actually a uh, dot matrix print. It's not a uh, photo imageable silk screen. You can see the dot pattern on there. And uh, but yeah, um, solder balls they could um, certainly account for it uh, as part because they're like sort of like a little unknown thing. You've got slightly too much paste 
you know, it's not exactly the same every time, even though, you know, there might be a smidgen over or just how the, you know, the dynamics of the paste and everything else and how it melts and things like that. Um, you can often get a stray solder ball. So I'm just looking for anything obvious like that. Uh, and I'm not so I wouldn't expect to see it up the top because this is like as I said this is the LCD chipset. All right, here we go. Here's the top board. We've got our here's our voltage input of course. There's two input protection resistors. I can measure those of course. They're uh, 1k. Good old brown brown black red there. And I don't think it's going to be our PTCs here because otherwise we wouldn't get anything. But anyway, oh, that got a little. Yeah, somebody's had a little crimp. No, no, it's all right. No worries there. But we could measure those. They should be about uh, a k each or something like that. But as I like, if it wasn't broken, like that doesn't explain like the zero ohms and things like that. And the MOVs here, well, you know, in theory it could be, but uh, doesn't explain why the hundred millivolt range was working, for example, and you know it couldn't measure one volt. Um, so you can measure those. They they should be open, of course. They should only start clamping it. Uh, uh, you know, a thousand volts or whatever they're uh, rated for. And we've got some uh, five meg input resistors here. You can measure those. Might be doing silly buggers, but we've got uh, um, input uh, jack uh, detection stuff like that. So it's not that. Um, so there's nothing on the top board really that you would suspect. I'd be going straight for down here, and let's so uh, let's have a squiz around here. And once again, I'm looking for bad joints. Oh, hello. Hang on. L9, is that my imagination? Hang on. Sorry, I don't, may not... Fo oh, no, no, that's all right. No, I thought there was no fillet on that. But it's, it's all good. So I'm looking for bad solder joints. I'm looking for uh, solder balls shorts other things but uh oh what's going on down there that oh hello hello l3 ta-da hello look at that l3 has cracked the solder joints on l3 have cracked we got one yep wow how has that happened it's Bend our wire out of the way there. Sorry about the light here. I can, uh, I can, there we go. That's going to be better. Wow. I thought it looked a bit askew. And you go there and sure enough, that puppy. Wow, that's, that's an inductor. And that has sheared right off. I mean, it's not like it's a heavy part. So that is very very interesting I'm going to well it's gone look at that there we go okay so what I'm going to do I'm going to take that out I'm going to put some fresh solder down on there those pads I'm going to uh, well I'll put fresh solder down on one I'll wick the other off and uh, replace that and I think it might come good again the one next to it Sorry about the uh, focus on this. The one next to it looks. The one next to it looks good. That is weird because, and okay, solder joints can crack like that, but uh, they're usually on high mass components. So, wow, I find that totally fascinating how it's able to do that. Oh, check that out. Something has gone horribly wrong with that. That's the bottom of it. It's like got black goo or some crud on there. That is really, really interesting. Wow. I wouldn't have expected, like, this was one of the things I was looking for, was a dodgy solder joint. I wouldn't have expected a surface mount part like that to shear off, but what is... Some, something's gone. What? What on earth has happened to that? Look, look at the side, the cap. Everything else is that blowing? 
Wow, like there's no way that inductor could blow. It's not, there's no way that could blow and not uh, blow the input circuitry. So that is, wow, that is toast. So I can't just, well, I could flip it over. I could flip it over and resolder it back on, but geez, you know, flip it, resolder it on upside down like that. But that is horrible. Has that just been a badly produced inductor? You can get that. Um, it, some Something's gone horribly wrong with that. Yep, I think we just have a bad inductor there. There's nothing wrong with the solder in. Look at that. There's the, uh, there's the other half of the, of the uh, cap from the inductor. And it's just, yeah, we have a faulty part. We have a faulty inductor. Something's gone horribly wrong with that inductor. And obviously it still made contact when they assembled this thing. It was still fine and would have uh, passed its test. But uh, after that, it's just gone horribly wrong. But as I said, there's no way that you could um, blow that inductor and not blow your inputs. So, you know, not have your input protection uh, trip and, you know, blow out your traces and everything else. So it hasn't been overloaded. I think we have a genuine inductor manufacturing fault. So there you go, I desoldered that from the PCB and that <laughs> and of course what we're dealing with here, uh, this is actually the common terminal, this wire here, even though it's <laughs> got red uh, insulation on it, actually it comes from the ground terminal on the um, front panel and they're just splitting those off, different traces to different parts of the circuitry up here. So anything that relied upon this ground connection here obviously did not work. So there we go, we're splitting some more. There's another uh, star grounding point, very nice. They know what they're doing there. Um, so uh, what they're doing, these, you see the little uh, slots in there too? They've got little isolation slots down in there. What they're doing with these, these aren't, um, uh, well, they're not wound inductors. These are uh, RFI uh, beads, actually, just for some high frequency rejection to, uh, like, you know, pass emission uh, standards and compliance and all that sort of jazz. So, yeah, I mean, you could bridge that over with a short if you wanted to. You could put in a zero ohm resistor if you didn't care about the, you know, the EMI uh, requirements and things like that. I'm not sure I have a suitable RFI bead, so I might just... Uh, potentially bridge that with a uh, zero ohm resistor uh, just for now and um, that should get us up and running. All right let's retest this puppy one volt and will we have a winner I think we will win a winner chicken dinner there we go ta-da that's all it was we had ourselves a faulty component I have no doubt everything else will work now if we just do the ohms for example the ohms will work ta-da there we go, works a treat. No problems. That was the only thing wrong. It was that uh, in was that RFI bead in there, which I'm pretty sure that's a faulty component. That hasn't happened during the soldering process, or you know, there's nothing wrong with the soldering process there. It was that component was crap. There was something seriously wrong with that, and well, yeah. Hmm. Happens. So I hope you found that interesting. I'm glad we actually uh, found that. That was pretty darn easy in the end. Only took, you know, seconds. It was like one of the first things I saw when I opened that, uh, when I took that uh, board off the back of it. So pretty easy. And we didn't need a schematic to find that. So component fault, these things happen. And to me, it doesn't uh, really reflect upon the quality of the product. If there was more than one and this was a, you know, a systemic problem, then we might have an issue. But hey, you know, ultimately you've got to trust the components that you're buying. You know, the genuine component you're buying from the genuine manufacturer, they're all in the real. You expect them to be manufactured properly. It's not like the, um, uh, the manufacturer of the meter or whatever product it is can actually inspect those parts for themselves. You rely on the fact that you're buying quality parts. And well, you know, occasionally um, you're going to have the odd component, uh, weird component failure like that for whatever uh, reason. If, as I said, it would have been uh, if it was like the entire reel, the entire batch of these little uh, ferrite beads that was uh, dodgy, then yeah, there would have been, you know, <laughs> I'm sure we would have had a lot more reports. So I suspect this might just be a one-off. Anyway, I hope so. Um, so yeah, I'll uh, definitely show Bryman 
this uh, video and they'll no doubt investigate it and uh, see if anything else. I might open a couple of other meters I've got in stock here, although this one actually, you know, I've only got the new batch, so uh, yeah. No, I don't think I can even open. Well, I'll open my current stock anyway, just to uh, have a squiz, and I'll give a little bit of a wiggle on the, uh, the ferrite bead down in there and uh, see what happens. But yeah, I, I'd be surprised if this was a systemic uh, problem across all meters. I think we've just encountered one of those weird uh, one-off Murphy's issues. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that uh, little hunt down of that uh, problem. If you want to comment, as always, links down below, leave YouTube comments, etc. Catch you next time. Hey, check this out. Look, amazing. Symmetrical multimeter stacking, just like the Philadelphia mass turbulence of 1984. Unbelievable. No human could stack multimeters like this. That's a few multimeters, 40 to be precise. I can't explain it, but there's something very therapeutic about doing this. Oh, yeah. So I've got my handy banana plug lead, here I go, oh goodness, the things I do.